Greetings and salutations. Welcome to a video about audio. Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite things, phono cartridges. That's the little box on the end of a tone arm you use to play a record. Records are my favorite things. I've been fascinated with them my entire life. The information in this video comes from my experience with records and also a lot of research that I have done over the last 15 years to put in videos about audio here on YouTube. Whether you're just vinyl curious or you've been in the hobby for quite some time, I hope you find this video useful. And if you do, please share it. It helps a lot. The first thing we want to talk about are some of the terms that you hear thrown around about phono cartridges and turntables in general, and also some of the measures that are used when talking about phono cartridges. The most common thing you'll hear about is vertical tracking force. This is the amount of force that's applied to the cartridge and the stylus to keep the needle in the groove. And the tone arm does that. Most tone arms these days do it by being little teeter-totters. They have a counterweight on one end and the cartridge on the other. Moving the counterweight back and forth allows you to dial in a very precise vertical tracking force. Getting the vertical tracking force right is the first step to making sure you're going to get the best sound. Next you'll hear about bias or anti-skate as it's more commonly known. And that is a lateral force that's applied to an arm to counteract skating. What is skating? A tone arm has an offset head shell. And if you measure it from the pivot of the arm out to the tip of the stylus, you're going to find that it's a little bit longer than the distance from the pivot of the arm to the spindle on the turntable. The offset head shell is there to help keep the arc at a minimum as it goes across the record playing from the beginning to the end. And because it's a little bit longer, that means that when you put the needle down on the record, it wants to keep on going around as the record spins. So if you have a blank record and you put the needle down on it, it will just skate across the record, jump up on the label, and slam into the spindle unless there is some way to counteract that, and that's what the skating force does. You might see some people set up skating force by using a blank record like that and making it so that the, the needle stands still and doesn't move across. And we'll talk about that. That's not always the best way to do it, but we'll talk about that later on. SRA VTA, Stylus Rake Angle and Vertical Tracking Angle. This refers to the angle at which the stylus goes down in the groove. When records are cut, it can't be 90 degrees. It has to be a little bit more than that. It's usually set around 92 because the stylus that's used to cut the original master has to be able to dig into the groove. So therefore, you want your playback stylus to kind of match that as closely as possible so it will track the side-to-side -side motion as faithfully as possible. Well, the only problem is the thickness of records varies greatly, so we can only approximate this. We'll talk more about it as we go on with the video. You'll hear the terms Bearwald, Stevenson, and Lofgren. They all refer to cartridge alignment strategies that minimize distortion. And this is something that is usually built into the tone arm, and every manufacturer has some way of setting up their tone arm to achieve either a Bearwald, Stevenson, or Lofgren curve as they are known. We're not going to get too heavily into that in this video. If you buy a turntable that's ready to go, it should be pre-aligned one way or the other. And of course there's lots of great information out there about how you can align your own turntable and I encourage you to go check it out. Let's talk about some of the measures now that you'll hear. We interchange imperial and metric quite freely in the world of records. So you just have to deal with that uh, whatever part of the world you come from. One measurement you'll hear a lot of is mils. This does not refer to millimeters. This is one one thousandth of an inch. 
grooves are usually measured in mils. The stylus tip measurements are usually in mils. To give you some idea of how big this is, a human hair is anywhere between two and five mils across. A millimeter, of course, is one one thousandth of a meter, and that's on pretty much every yardstick and ruler you come across anywhere. And cartridges, their dimensions and their heights and all of the uh, things that you need to know are usually in millimeters. Except you may hear some cartridges referred to as being half-inch cartridges. That means they have two screws on top that are a half inch apart that fit into a standard head shell. There are other kinds of cartridges. There are plug-in cartridges. In the 80s, Techniques came along with a tone arm called a T4P tone arm that used a plug-in cartridge, and that system is generally referred to as P-mount. It's very rare today. Audio-Technica is the only company currently making P-mount cartridges. Uh, so you might not come across that unless you're going to be restoring older turntables. And finally, we want to talk about forces and weights. They are generally always measured in grams when it comes to phono cartridges. So if you're going to be measuring the weight of a cartridge, you need a scale that is very good at measuring grams. The next thing to talk about here would be the parts of a phono cartridge. And they're actually really simple devices. There's not a whole lot of voodoo going on in there. Um, you have the cantilever, which people refer to as the needle. On the end of that, you have a stylus affixed to it. That's the part that actually goes into the record, and that should be made of diamond. You should not be playing your records, any kind of records, if you care for your records with anything other than diamond. I know that there are sapphire styluses out there, especially on dirt cheap Chinese record players. You should avoid them like the plague. They eat records. And every now and again, you'll come across some old guy who says, well, I like those I like them sapphire styluses because they give a warmer sound. Yeah, they give a warmer sound because they're chewing up the groove as they go through them. Uh, fortunately, those guys are very few and far between. They give me the willies just thinking about it. Even if you do want to play around with like a really cheap turntable like a Crosley or a Victrola, please upgrade the stylus to a diamond stylus as quickly as possible. The cantilever goes up into the cartridge there, and you'll see that there's a rubber suspension. That usually holds it, but allows it to move. And they talk about the compliance of a cartridge. Well, that is usually determined by that suspension. And compliance is directly related to how much vertical tracking force that you need in order to keep that stylus firmly against the groove walls. And at the end of the cantilever, if it's a moving magnet cartridge, you'll find a magnet which is very close to a coil. When that magnet moves close to that coil, it generates electricity in that coil, which corresponds directly to the vibrations it picks up from the groove. People sometimes say, or they ask, how does the cartridge read the information in the groove? It doesn't read anything. In the groove, it wobbles back and forth in an exact analog to the sound that was sent to the recording stylus. That recording stylus moved back and forth and cut that groove. And the playback stylus simply follows it. It's a live performance every time. A moving coil cartridge has the roll of the magnet and the coil reversed, as you see in this image here. The coil itself is attached to the cantilever and the magnet is in the cartridge. And they are more expensive and they usually give uh, uh, less distortion on playback, uh, but you cannot replace the styli. There's a lot of advantages and disadvantages to moving coil cartridges. Another kind of cartridge is the ceramic cartridge. These are very rare these days except on super cheap turntables and they usually track way heavier than you would want to and they also come with those lovely little sapphire styli I was talking about. Back 30 years ago, 40 years ago, let's say in the 80s, 70s, 60s, ceramic cartridges were more common and they 
had some very nice high fidelity cartridges that were available on turntables from places like Radio Shack or the BSRs would sometimes have ceramics on them. Uh, there was a company in the 50s and 60s called Sonatone that made very high fidelity ceramic phono cartridges and they work on a completely different principle. The idea is, is that the stylus vibrates a little piece of ceramic and through the piezoelectric effect you generate electricity working much the same as a moving magnet cartridge and they have different properties entirely but they're very rare today unless you're restoring an old turntable by the way I do have to acknowledge our graphic here it's from the U-Turn audio website uh, where they have a lot of cool information about their turntables and a lot of good general information as well those are great guys and they make great turntables I have to give them a shout out and no they're not sponsors of any way shape or form just uh, I happen to be a fan so let's take a look at stylus shapes there are three basic groups of stylus shape one of them and the most common that you'll find is conical or spherical as they're known because they're like balls and then they, we have elliptical shapes an elliptical shape tries to follow the back and forth motion of the groove closer uh, we'll we'll see how that is when we get into talking about ellipticals most quote-unquote hi-fi turntables today will ship with an elliptical stylus but there's some very nice conical equipped cartridges out there as well and then you have exotic stylus shapes and we'll talk more about those at the end of the video these are highly specialized shapes that try and closely match the shape of the stylus that actually records the record styli also come in bonded or nude a bonded stylus and we have two examples here um, is one in which that we add a little extra part to our cartridge we have a shank so the cantilever at the end of the cartridge has a shank and then we have a little stylus tip which is made of diamond and the diamond is glued to the shank one way or the other this is a cheaper way of making a phono cartridge bonded phono cartridges can range from awful sounding to incredibly good but it all depends on the quality of manufacture. Generally, these days, when you have a bonded stylus, you're going to get very so-so performance. And we'll talk more about that as we move on. Interestingly enough, the way records are recorded these days is very standardized. The shape of the stylus that cuts the record, it's all laid out in the Westrex 4545 system, which is used for stereo records these days but there is no standard playback which is the reason why we have all these different stylish shapes and different opinions about what sounds best and what works best for what kind of record it makes the hobby fun that's for sure so let's dig into conical styli it's shaped like a ball at the tip it is the easiest styli to manufacture it's the most common in the world and it's been around for a very long time. A 3 mil styli is used to play back 78s, whether they be made out of shellac or vinyl, and you'll need one of those if you intend to try and play those older records back. They were made up until about 1960 or so. Then we came along with LPs in 1948 and in 1949, 45s, and they had the micro groove which was intended to be played by a one mil stylus. One mil styli are just for those old records because when stereo came along in the late 50s, 1957 and 58, the uh, standard was changed to 0.7 for modern stereo grooves and many of the modern conical styli these days are 0.6 which is a little bit smaller which means they track a little lower and they track the grooves a little better and they have less distortion most of the styli that audio technica sells in the conical variety are 0.6 these days they are capable of high vertical tracking force without damage to records 
And so some people, like when they look at a cartridge like the Audio-Technica AT3600L, see the recommended tracking force being 3 grams, and they get all freaked out. Well, that's going to tear my record up. No, it will not. Not with a conical stylus. There is a very small contact area, and uh, that means that you're doing very little damage when you play back a record with a conical stylus. Older versions of conical styli, especially when you get into Stanton and Shure cartridges that were designed for radio and jukebox cartridges as well, they need to track between 3 and 5 grams just so they'll stay in the groove and they won't get sibilance distortion. And that's perfectly all right. They do not damage records. The uh, general wisdom is that tracking anywhere below 5 grams is perfectly acceptable with a conical, sty conical stylus, although uh, some research says that you should keep it under 4 grams, and that goes way back to the 1960s. Um, my general rule of thumb is to keep everything under 3 grams as far as tracking force is concerned. We'll talk more about that later in the video, too. Uh, these uh, styli are good for just about any kind of record, uh, whether it be an old mono record or a polystyrene 45, damaged records you pick up at yard sales. You really want to play them back with this kind of stylus. It does the least amount of damage, and it tends to track uh, odd grooves very, very well. That's one of the reasons they were used in radio pretty much exclusively, especially when the radio used to play records directly on the air. It sounded better with more different types of records. Uh, they don't cost a whole lot. They're widely available. Uh, the anti-skate is usually a little less than what you would need for elliptical styli, but not by much. Uh, you can follow your tone arm manufacturer's instructions and switch back and forth between mild elliptical and conical and get your anti-skate where it should be and you shouldn't have to worry about that too much. I didn't put it here on the slide but I did want to mention that um, the downside of a conical stylus is that they tend to be less detailed especially in the high frequencies uh, so you're not getting quite the clarity that you would get with a more advanced stylus shape and they also tend to play up things like inner groove distortion just a little bit however uh, they are very tolerant to the setup that you have so if you have your alignment slightly off or anything your stylus rake angle it's not quite where it should be because the tip of this stylus is a ball it means that uh, you're not going to hear an appreciable difference. So a lot of folks love to play their records with conical styli. I am one. Uh, I have always kept a conical stylus around, especially for my polystyrene 45s, and uh, I just like the sound of them. I think that they have a generally good sound. Next, let's talk about elliptical styli, and there's a lot to talk about here because these are the most common ones that you find these days. And the idea here is that you have improved tracking ability, uh, and it shows more detail uh, with a proper setup, which means that when you're running an elliptical stylus, you really need to make sure that your alignment is right, you're running the right vertical tracking force, and a good SRA and uh, any any kind of measurement that you can take. You just want it to be as aligned closely to properly as possible. And uh, they are shaped like an American football with the pointy ends pointing toward the groove walls. And there's a little graphic down there in the corner and it kind of shows the difference between a conical stylus and an elliptical stylus tracking the groove. So as the groove goes back and forth, you'll see that the elliptical stylus goes around corners easier. Uh, you can have on highly modulated records played with a conical stylus a situation where that ball actually gets pinched as it goes around corners, especially with high frequencies, and this causes distortion in the sound. Uh, that's one of the reasons that a lot of modern styli that are conical are shipped at 0.6. Uh, just to lessen that just a little bit. Uh, 
Elliptical styli go from a mild elliptical, which is generally a 0.4 by 0.7, and then there's kind of the standard these days is 0.3 by 0.7. You see that everywhere. And hyperelliptical refers to a stylus which would be 0.2 by 0.7 mil. So that is really a, a tight shape there. And uh, Shure used to sell a lot of hyperellipticals with 0.2 by 0.7, but uh, they're very rare today. I don't see any hyperelliptical styli offered unless they're aftermarket styli uh, from companies uh, like uh, LP Gear or turntable needles or something like that for existing cartridges. With uh, an elliptical stylus you really should never go over three grams uh, no matter what the shape is and especially if you're talking about a 0.2 by 0.7 those usually track extremely light like 1.5 grams or less because uh, you have the potential for more record wear with an elliptical stylus and uh, uh, so it's just a really good idea to follow the manufacturer's recommended tracking force very closely. These days, it's usually right around 2 grams. That is acceptable for most medium mass tone arms, and that's what most of the major manufacturers say that you should track out. Nude elliptical sounds better due to a lower mass at the tip and uh, better tracking. See, when you have a bonded elliptical stylus or even a bonded conical, you have a situation where usually that shank and the glue that holds it on, that weighs more. It has more mass, and that groove has to move that back and forth. And because it has a higher mass, it makes it harder to keep contact with the groove walls. Things tend to rattle around a little bit, and that causes distortion. This is the reason why there's such a difference between an Ortofon 2M red and an Ortofon 2M blue cartridge. The only difference is that the red comes with a cheap bonded stylus which, which has a pretty high tip mass and those cartridges tend to sound kind of nasty uh, on certain records especially ones with a lot of high frequency modulation and if you upgrade to the 2M blue with the nude stylus which is exactly the same shape everything just immediately clears up. It's the same thing with Audio-Technica, for instance, moving from the AT95EB to the AT95EN, bonded to nude, makes a huge difference in the sound. Uh, prices range widely on cartridges with elliptical styli, and you pretty much get what you pay for. If it is a cheap Stylus, whether it's elliptical or not, it's going to sound cheap. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's some not some good bargains out there. And it all depends on your ears. I think that the Audio-Technica VM95EN with a nude elliptical stylus is absolutely a steal. Those cartridges go for just over $100 right now. Uh, most tone arm anti-skate systems are tuned for elliptical. In other words, if your turntable says to set your anti-skate at 2 because you are tracking at 2 grams uh, vertical tracking force, that would mean that if you're running a, uh, just a standard elliptical stylus, that that's going to be pretty close to right. And if you don't want to really fool around with anti-skate and you're running a, an elliptical stylus, uh, usually doing that works out just fine. It gives you right about the right anti-skate. Of course, if you have one of those fishing line anti-skate mechanisms, then you're just doing that in a range, which is okay too, because anti-skate is very approximate. We'll talk about that later on in more detail. Uh, elliptical shapes wear down faster than conical and exotic shapes. So you're going to go through these quicker. Uh, Ortofon says about 350 hours for their conical, uh, rather their elliptical styli. And uh, Audio-Technica is very conservative and they say about 300 hours and they measure that by distortion at 15 kilohertz. So it's very high up and if you are over the age of 40 you probably can't hear that anyway but it's still a good idea to replace these styli often um, simply because of the fact that they do wear quicker. However, even though they do wear quicker, they're still safe for most old mono records and polystyrene 45s. They don't seem to cause a great deal of damage, 
and so feel free to play whatever you got with them. Uh, you might want to be a little bit careful with that if you have a 0.2 by 0.7 mil uh, elliptical styli, but just make sure that you're tracking that uh, where it's supposed to be tracked and not too heavily. Lastly, we'll talk about exotic styli, and these are also known as advanced shapes. I've called them that in videos I've done in the past. And these shapes try to closely match the shape of the groove, and uh, tone arm setup is absolutely critical. You have to have a turntable with a very precise setup, and you need to really be able to dial these in. So if you have a cheap turntable and maybe it's a fixed anti skate that you can't change uh, which is happens with a lot of low-end turntables like the uh, the uh, Riga Plan R1 and also the Automat one from um, Project is one like that uh, they allow you to change cartridges but not much else uh, this would not be a good idea you don't want to spend a great deal of money on one of these advanced styli for it because you're just not going to get the best out of it uh, names include uh, Shibata, Vandenhall, Microlinear, or Microline. Those are trademark names from Audio-Technica. Uh, Vividline is another uh, trademark name that you'll find, and just calling them Line Contact as well. If you look at the graphic here, you'll see that uh, these styli have uh, these very tiny ridges that come out on either side, sort of like super hyper-elliptical and the idea here is that they maintain contact with that groove all the time. They never have any opportunity to lose contact, and uh, they uh, will track sophisticated modulation very closely. Um, they require a bit more anti-skate than elliptical styli, uh, which is something that Audio-Technica is not telling people who buy these cartridges these days. I just bought one myself, and I found uh, by doing some research that Audio-Technica does recommend a 1.2 to 1 ratio when it comes to anti-skate. These are very expensive styli, but they do last longer, between 800 and 1,000 hours. Some people who have microscopes and can monitor the condition of their styli and have very clean records say that you can push these out to 1,500 hours with absolutely no distortion to hear and no damage to records, but I wouldn't recommend pushing it past a thousand unless you had some way to check on that, either a Microsoft yourself, or a micro Microsoft, <laughs> microscope, excuse me, or uh, you have access to a shop that does that, that you can take it in and have them look at it. Uh, this is not recommended for polystyrene 45s or early mono LPs and 45s as these things are very much engineered to fit into a standard stereo record groove. Now if you have a modern record which is in mono, chances are it was cut on a stereo lathe. They just put the audio in mono combined left and right. But if you're talking about an authentic mono LP pressed before let's say 1960, this might not be the stylus for you. It might track weird. It might go down to the bottom of the groove and get down into that uh, debris field at the bottom. Uh, you might not want to do that. So that's up to you to experiment with. I personally, since I have moved on to one of these on my main turntable, have set up another turntable that has uh, a light tracking conical stylus that I'll use for 45s that are made of polystyrene and any old mono LPs or any records that uh, I find at yard sales that I don't know the condition of yet. I don't want to play it on the main turntable, that sort of thing. So those are the basics as far as stylus shape is concerned. And now we will end up with some tips and tricks that will help you to get the most out of whatever kind of cartridge you have and whatever turntable you're using. First and foremost, when you set up your turntable, make sure that it is level. If the feet on the turntable do not allow you to level it, then go and get some little wood shims that you can put under the table that it sits on to make sure that the table itself is level. Get a spirit level and put it on the platter of the turntable. That's the best way to tell if it's level. 
Um, that doesn't mean that you can't play with your new turntable if you don't have one of those. It'll probably be all right if it's close to level, but if you really want to dial it in, you want to get the best performance, you want to make your stylus last the longest, you don't want to uh, damage your records, add extra wear to them, make sure that turntable is level. It's very important. Set your vertical tracking force very carefully as well. And it's better to track heavier than it is lighter. Some people get very freaked out about vertical tracking force, and they, they, they think that tracking as lightly as possible will minimize damage to your records. That's a myth. It's absolutely not true. Tracking too light, especially with an elliptical stylus or with an advanced shape, will cause that stylus to rattle around in that groove. You do not have enough downward pressure to hold it against the groove walls and the pressure that is generated, the forces that are generated within a record groove on a piece of diamond that's moving back and forth at 12 kilohertz, that's 12,000 times per second, are measured in tons. So you want to make sure that it has the tightest contact as possible and it's not losing contact and then slamming back into the groove wall that's when you get damage it, it tends to tear the vinyl causes all kinds of problems so it is better to track a little heavier usually most tone arms these days that I have seen that you balance and float and then dial in the tracking force are very accurate but if you want to get really accurate you can get one of the little digital scales um, that you see advertised for setting up uh, stylus tracking. Uh, they're relatively inexpensive these days, and if you're going to be fooling around with it a lot, you might want to get one, but you can follow the directions about uh, floating your tone arm and then dialing in as well, and you'll get pretty close. Um, SRA is approximate, and so is Antiscape. Let's talk about Antiscape first of all. A lot of people these days take a blank record or a CD or an old laser disc or a plastic plate, whatever, and put it on their turntable and then they take their anti-skate dial and they set it until the needle does not move toward the center or out toward the edge when the turntable is level. This method of setting anti-skate gives you a little bit too much, usually. So you can use this as a starting point if you'd like, but then dial it down a little bit to where that uh, stylus starts moving toward the center of the record slowly, and that'll get you closer to the ballpark of being correct. The reason why is there's a big difference in friction on a record that has no grooves on it and the friction the stylus encounters when it's down in a groove, especially when that groove is modulated. The skating force varies determined by the modulation in the groove, how deep the groove is, and also by the position it is on the record. It changes from the outer edge of the record toward the inner edge of the record toward the label. And so therefore this is always an approximation. You don't want to run like none because that's not good and you don't want to run too much because that's bad because that's pulling your stylus uh, toward the uh, outer wall of the groove which is your right channel. You want to try and get this where it's right where it needs to be and there are several ways to check that out. They have test records and then you look at it with an oscilloscope to see if there's distortion. I find that most turntables that I've played with and you're using an elliptical stylus if you follow the manufacturer's directions it'll get you right in the ballpark. But if you find that when you put your needle down on the record and it wants to jump in, you'll, you'll have that happen. The first thing you need to check is your anti-skate. Make sure that uh, your vertical tracking force and anti-skate are where they need to be. SRA is approximate, and I mentioned that earlier. There are some audiophiles online that recommend that you go out and get a microscope so that you can verify that your stylus tracks at exactly 92 degrees. That is a bunch of BS because it's going to change from record to record. You want to try to get it close. And it's always better to have the tone arm slightly nose down. If you can't have it completely level on uh, your uh, 
thinnest record, you want it to be just a little bit nose down. You really do not want to have the situation where the cartridge is kind of pointing up because when you start leaning back, you really start losing those high frequencies. As you lean forward a little bit, the high frequencies will become accentuated, but if you go too far, you'll start getting sibilance. Really, honestly, there's a wide range here that most people are not going to be able to hear a difference, so getting it close is fine. And if your turntable does not have a tone arm that you can adjust the height of the tone arm, and most don't, um, that are you know reasonably priced, just change the mat on the turntable. You can get an extra mat and put it on there to raise it up depending on your cartridge. Or you can also, when you install a new cartridge, get a little spacer to put in there. So if you have a particularly short cartridge, let's say your turntable is looking for a cartridge that, that is like 18 millimeters tall, like Ortofon cartridges are, and you'd like to use uh, the cartridges from uh, Audio-Technica or my, maybe an old Stanton, which are even shorter. Stantons are about 16 and Shures are about 16. And then the, the modern audio technicas, all of them are right around 17 millimeters, which honestly is not that much different. But if you want to, you can take a little shim and put it between the cartridge and the head shell if you want to. I don't bother with that. I usually just kind of adjust it with a mat or not worry too much about it, to tell you the truth, as long as it's pretty close. Change your styli often. If you are using an elliptical stylus, the general rule of thumb is to change it once a year if you play about a record a year. Most of us don't use our turntable every single day. We'll use it maybe once, twice a week, and usually we sit down and play two or three records. Uh, so it all kind of works out to be five to seven records a week, okay? If that's the rate at which you play records, that's going to add up to be about 350 something hours by the end of the year, up give or take, right around 300. And so therefore, that's when you should replace your stylus. If you use your turntable all the time, then you might want to do it every six months. If you have an advanced stylus shape or a moving coil cartridge, then you've paid the kind of money that probably means that you should be taking that cartridge into an audio shop uh, to have it looked at or you should look at it with a microscope because then you'll know when to replace it. Um, but generally speaking, Shibatas last about 800. Uh, Audio Technica says that their microlinear styli last about a thousand. So the rate that I play records, for instance, which is maybe once or twice a day, you know, playing a record when it averages all out, then I should be able to get away with about three years before I should think about changing. But if you have any questions at all, get a new one. Playing a record with an old damaged stylus is a sure way to destroy it. And here's another thing. When you start reading about records and audio equipment online, people have opinions. And some people are bullies about it. And some people say that if you don't spend three to five thousand dollars on your stereo system, it's not good enough. Don't listen to these people. Don't believe them. Your equipment is good enough if it sounds good to you. If you want to upgrade, that's great. But don't feel pressured to upgrade. Because the truth of the matter is there is no reference. There are several different ways that I have talked about in this video to playback records. And this concept of having the perfect turntable that plays every record back exactly accurately and there's some sort of mythical reference that is perfection doesn't exist. It doesn't exist in the recording studio. I know that because I've worked in radio and recording most of my adult life and there is no perfection. We try and do as best as we can. And there's no perfection on the reproducing side either. Even with digital audio and CDs with their exact precision, it, there's a lot of variables involved here. So if it sounds good to you and you're happy with it, then be happy with it. If you want to upgrade, that's up to you. Nobody should force you into doing that. I will say, though, that if somebody gave you a Crosley or Victrola turntable or one of these other cheap little systems, and this is what you're playing your records on, you really need to consider getting a real turntable if you want to continue with the hobby. 
Number one, you're not getting what you can get out of them. Uh, these systems simply do not produce any sort of fidelity. And number two, those systems track very heavy and they destroy records. So if you're going to be doing this and you want to keep records for years and years, do invest in something that is kinder to your records and will give you something uh, closer to a high fidelity sound. But beyond that, it's entirely up to you. Thanks for watching the video, boys and girls. I hope you found it useful. We'll have another one up soon about audio somewhere here in the not too distant future. And once again, if this video was useful to you, please share it and give it a like. That helps as well. Thanks for watching.